Hi, Steve Selig, founder of Fit Test. This is another case study, uh, part five of this series on atrial fibrillation and exercise. So first of all, I just want to quickly summarise and in very, very briefly, uh, the main um, medical interventions for people in atrial fibrillation. And so what is often tried um, early on are anti-arrhythmic medications, and these are designed to try and get people back into a rhythmic heart. And I guess the main ones to consider are the calcium channel blockers, amiodarone and sotalol. So you will see quite a lot of people who, especially newly diagnosed, newly treated people with atrial fibrillation on one of these uh, drugs. These don't always work, um, and um, they, but they do also control heart rate. So even if someone stays in atrial fibrillation, in other words, they don't deal with the arrhythmia, uh, they will still help to control heart rate, which is still a benefit of these drugs. Now, cardioversion refers to an elective um, defibrillation procedure under light anaesthetic, and uh, this is designed to shock the upper chambers of the heart, which is where the atrial fibrillation is occurring, uh, to get back into uh, rhythm uh, coming from the main pacemaker cells, the sinoatrial node. Now, um, what I will be talking about in this case study particularly um, is the ablation therapies. And there are two main ablation therapies that I'm going to just very quickly summarise here. And the first is called pulmonary vein isolation. And what they do here is they have some diagnostic catheters in place. So it's a, it's a, a catheter procedure. This, this whole ablation procedure is done by catheter with um, it's a day procedure, maybe an overnight stay, but essentially a day procedure. So these diagnostic uh, catheters are there to, to map all the electrical activity in the heart. And then there's some uh, ablation catheters, which as you can see here, are surrounding the pulmonary veins. There are only two pulmonary veins shown on this diagram. I think the other two are over here, but they're only, it's not just showing those two at the moment. And they're creating rings of scar tissue uh, around those pulmonary vein insertions into the upper left atrium, left chamber. Uh, and in creating that scar tissue, it means that the arrhythmias that may be occurring in here, or very commonly occurring in here, can't escape into the rest of the atria and the rest of the heart. And so then the normal pacemaker tissues, which are up here, the sinoatrial node, can then resume to take up the rhythm and control of the whole of the heart. And so this is effectively uh, a reversal of that rhythm disturbance using this technique. What they normally do is create these uh, rings of scar tissue around both, uh, sorry, all four of the pulmonary veins. There's other two here as well. And they use either hot, heat or cold therapy uh, to do that. Now, um, what is involved in this case study is a different form of ablation called atrioventricular nodal ablation. And here, um, the pulmonary veins are not touched at all. And this is, I'll, I'll go into why they uh, might do uh, this alternative technique. But what they do here is ablate, in other words, create scar tissue around the, what would otherwise be a normal, healthy atrioventricular node. Now this is the second cluster of pacemaker tissues in the heart, and it's in the lower right atrium or the lower part of the right upper chamber as opposed to the, the most um, or the most dominant pacemaker cells are up here called the sinoatrial node. Now by knocking out the atrioventricular node which was otherwise healthy what the cardiologists are doing there is intentionally separating electrically separating the upper chambers which are in fibrillation from the lower chambers and then the lower chambers are no longer going to experience an arrhythmia but they require pacing, and that's the key point. Um, so a pacemaker must be fitted in, this, in the setting of atrioventricular nodal ablation so that the two lower chambers can be paced uh, in rhythm and with an appropriate rate, even though the atria continue to fibrillate. So in this case study, we have a 53-year-old, I'll just show you that, so a 53-year-old female with a family history of atrial enlargement and atrial fibrillation. And she was troubled for a couple of years with um, really disturbing episodes, long episodes of atrial fibrillation that could last days. And so 
Um, in 2019, she, they attempted to do a cardio version using that day procedure of elective defibrillation. And um, that um, did give her some symptom relief or some relief from atrial fibrillation for a couple of months. But then she came back in in um, uh, she came back in in, 2000, in uh, June 2019. And then they attempted again, but a month later she was back in atrial fibrillation. So the decision was made then um, to, and I'll just go to this, to, to ablate the atrioventricular node that was otherwise healthy, as I described on the previous slide. And that is to electrically separate out the fibrillating atria above from the healthy ventricles below, and but they then needed pacing, and that's why a month before this, a pacemaker was fitted, PPM standing for permanent pacemaker, and she also had an intracardiac defibrillator fitted at that time as well. Now, I saw her a month after her atrioventricular nodal ablation, and about five weeks after her pacemaker had been fitted. So the pacemaker was relatively new. And she was on the normal medications for um, her atrial fibrillation, uh, metoprolol and Xarelto. So that was all about rate control and um, protection for atrial thrombus. Remembering that after all of these techniques, after the AV nodal ablation, the atria themselves are still fibrillating and still need protection against intraatrial blood clotting. Hence the river roxaban or Xarelto needed to be given. Now this is what I actually found. I, I had the advantage of having an ECG, but that you certainly don't need to have an ECG. You just need to have a decent heart rate monitor. But just to show you what happened on ECG, and this is after her ablation and after her pacemaker had been fitted. Now the interesting thing is the V1 lead is sitting over the atria and the V5 lead is sitting over the ventricles, in fact, the left ventricle. Now, the first thing with the um, atria is that you can see the atrial fibrillation occurring along the baseline all the way through here is ongoing. But on the V5, the ventricle, you can see that there is um, really nice rhythm. There's no arrhythmia that we saw in another presentation in this series. So this has cured the arrhythmia and the ventricles are now beating in rhythm and with a good rate of 75 beats per minute. In fact, it, the pacemaker had been programmed to 75 at this point. When we went to exercise, and we did a pretty, uh, we did a multi-stage exercise test, and you can see a lot of minute stages here, so about a 10 minute test. And she reached a fairly high RPE, ratings of perceived exertion. But again, uh, the fibrillation is still occurring in the atria, but, it, but the uh, ventricles are showing, again, very good rhythm all the way through exercise. The rate is incredibly low at 92, and I could only interpret that as meaning that the pacemaker still needed to be fine-tuned. It had only been implanted five weeks before this assessment. And I certainly let the referring medical practitioner know what we found at fairly high intense exercise. And I expect that in the next six to 12 months, these heart rates will be much higher for her, but also she'll continue to be paced and be very safe to exercise. So she is totally safe <coughs> to exercise. I was able to use FitTest, my app, to estimate VO2 peak at 23. And you'll notice the heart rate peak 92 was only 53% of her age predicted heart rate peak. Now, if you had used any other app um, that had used the age predicted heart rate peak, we would have uh, absolutely huge errors, in fact, overestimations of her fitness and therefore it would make the exercise potentially unsafe. So uh, my app certainly works beautifully uh, for this situation. The other thing you can see is that the increases in heart rate were extremely linear all the way through, even though the heart rate, the overall heart rate response to increasing exercise intensities was incredibly flat. So that's really all I wanted to do in, in presenting this case study. And you can get back to me uh, at info, uh, info at So have a great day and thanks for watching this video. Bye for now.